I'm Chris Barker. And I'm Will Betts. And this is Music Tech's My Forever Studio podcast, brought to you in partnership with Audient. And this time we're coming to you from Tile Yard Studios in London. In this podcast, we speak with musicians, producers, DJs and engineers about their fantasy forever studio. The studio that our guests dream up is one they must live with for eternity. But even in Studio Foreverland, we do have some rules, don't we? Yes, that's right. The rules. Our guests get to choose a computer, a DAW and an audio interface. Those are free, but then they only get six other bits of audio equipment however there's one more rule no bundles that's right choosing a package of software or hardware that is sold as a bundle will not be allowed this time we're joined by a critically acclaimed producer remixer and dj that's right our guest has remixed people like daft punk the chemical brothers he's worked with bands like lay the pier the mystery jets and even the mighty duran duran He's also a passionate gear nerd with some amazing equipment in his own studio so this might be a challenge for him could be challenging. That's right. This is my forever studio with Errol Alken. Welcome, Hi, Errol. Welcome. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm all right, thanks. It's pretty early. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I got coffee. So it's as, it's whatever time people are watching or listening to this at. That's right. Yeah, we exist oh. outside of time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's Fantasy the... forever time. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, okay, so you sort of heard the rules there. Um, yeah. I mean, before we get into building the, the dream studio, let's talk about little getting into this this old production game i mean you started off as, as a musician or a dj or a bit of both like how did that start um my uh earliest attempts at making sound or or manipulating sound goes right back to when i was probably about 10 or 11 years old uh i had bought a well my my, my father Finally, given in and got me uh, a Spectrum computer. That was after. Um, for everyone who don't know the Spectrums, they were these tiny little uh, computers, the size of an iPad. They had like rubber buttons on them, and um, they only had forty k of forty eight k of memory. So, which was advertised. That was a thing, though. The... It, it was actually the Spectrum forty eight k. Yeah, yeah, that was the name of it. <laughs> um, and uh, so it was. It, it was extremely basic sounds was monophonic mm. and if you wanted to make sound or make a melody you had to program it in um by going beep a number which was the note and then a comma and then you put another number after it which would uh, be the like the the length of the note and then you put like a, another thing in to make a space or a rest so or kind anything of like, like that so like tracker software meets making a melody on the old nokia phones it, it's more like the melody on the Nokia phone, yeah, actually, yeah. exactly like that. Yeah, like like twenty years ago. Yeah. Uh, so I, I remember making uh, ringtones. Yeah, on me that too. As well. You you uh, you the one in the friendship group that made everybody's ringtones for um, them. That's what I was. That's cool. <laughs> I, I only can't. made my own. I only <laughs> bespoke for myself. <laughs> bespoke. <laughs> oh, I hide myself out. Did you? Yeah. Oh, that yeah, makes yeah. Sense. yeah. Yeah. Get me something from the vending machine. I'll do the neighbours theme tune for you. <laughs> <laughs> what was your go-to? What my, were you programming on there? Uh, on the Spectrum or the Nokia? Oh, the I've, Nokia. I. You know what? <laughs> I only programmed one because it took so long, but I I always thought it sounded like a good ringtone. And you know the uh, the opening synth line from the Chemical Brothers music response. Okay, okay, nice. right. You know that line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That that one I thought it sound would sound great on a Nokia just because of the it's like a square wave yeah. sort of sound, and yeah. I just thought it would anyway, and it did. So um, that was the only one I did on there. But back then on the Spectrum, um, my uncle like tasked me with. Um, he asked me, oh, can you do the theme from Knight Rider on that? So I, I spent an age programming the theme from Knight Rider on the Spectrum. What was his purpose for that? Well, I think it's just one of... Like, doing the theme from Knight Rider, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but we were both we were both fans of Knight Rider, you yeah. know. Um, it, it's like one of those things where you kind of like go in like, you know, you've got the opportunity to do something, you know, what, what piece of music... Um, is important to you enough to to go and you know mimic it or copy it or something like that so, so um, your first route into making sounds was was programming was well like, i was a programmer yeah. actually I, could, I mean i got into computer programming um first really mm. like so i learned how to program um well i mean back then when you, when you used to buy computer magazines there'd be a section that like reviewed games there'd be a section that was news about games that were coming and there'd be a whole programming section mm. so i would read these things cover to cover so i'd be like well why don't i try to write my own like code why don't i mm. learn how to hack software you know which is what i ended up doing and you know you do those things where you'd go in and 
you, you know, you find the bit of code that how many lives it gave you in the game, and then you'd give yourself like a hundred, you know. <laughs> so you know, I, I, I learned how code worked, and then from, from there, I kind of lo- learned. I've had some d- dabbled in ASCII code as well, but then shortly after that, I got um, I got an Amiga computer, nice. which five hundred. It was five hundred, yeah, Amiga five hundred, and that came with um, a piece of software called Sound Tracker. Oh yeah, and I bought a digitizer, which plugged in the back, a big clunky thing, and you could, I, I kind of like, like, took the output of my stereo uh, that I had in my room at the time into there, and then would like sample um, just bits from records that I liked, you know, like little bit. I mean, because so many productions back in the late eighties would have like little bits of like public enemy yeah. things in there. First thing I did was just like go and find those little bits of like Flavor Flav or Chuck D in other words and have a whole like get them all sampled in and save them onto a disc and whatever. And then, you know, I was listening to a lot of Rave um then as well. So, you know, you'd sample, you know, break beats and the eight men break or whatever, you know. So the sort of the kind of indie guitar side that some people might know you for in terms of the bands you've worked for and, you know, you know, you can play, you're a musician as well, right? Like that came later. Well, the whole thing about being, am I, you know, into electronic music or am I into guitar music? I mean, for me, it's just music, you know, it doesn't like music has always been like language to me, you know, and it's how you understand or decipher certain language. Mm. And if you're able to even uh, repeat it, if you're able to speak in that language as well, you know, there's certainly a load of musical styles that I would never attempt to try to speak in, you know, because I don't feel um, uh, fluent in it in, in that sense. So that's a good way. To you know, it, yeah. I, 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 you know, I, I just absorb what I absorb and, and I try and I try to put out what I feel I want to communicate really. So, you know, guitar, I mean, I, back in 1990 when I was you know sampling things on my Amiga or whatever, you know, I was listening to pipe radio plus, you know, I was watching like top of the pops or the chart show or whatever. And, you know, He's being completely blown away by guitar bands at the same time. I wasn't ever told that you had to choose one or the other. Yeah. Apart from a little bit in the playground where some kids would be, you know, they're into something and they're not into something else. And to me, that just baffled me. Like, mm. why? Why well, that, you... that attitude was was really important because you know you were at the forefront, or one of the people at the forefront of that that fusion between sort of club culture and indie culture. Um, you know, because indie kids weren't going to you know see djs really mm. uh and then it all sort of did happen with things like lcd and the nights you were doing and like bands and acts like soul wax too many dj sets mm. and that kind of again that same attitude of just like being sort of genre agnostic as such <laughs> like we just like good tr- good tunes yeah exactly it that, united yeah. that that night out crowd though as well i mean i remember going to your nights and it being like the goth kids the indie kids mm. the ravers you know it yeah. just didn't matter. It, it didn't would, matter. Yeah. I mean, I, I still, I'm still, I mean, I was surprised then when, when it was like a big thing that, you know, like, oh, you know, this is happening or you're doing this or, and just to me, and also like, you know, when I met Dave and Steph Solwax as well, when we first met and I first like went through their record collection. I mean, we first met when, when they were actually DJing at their own after show party in Dingwalls in like 99 or something like that. Um, and I, I went and introduced myself because I, I kind of like I kind of got in touch with them about playing at Trash um, in '99. So this is well before all the you know um, a lot of stuff happened for all of us. And the first thing they said to me was like, "Really nice to meet you. Could you just look after our records for one sec and like put one on? If it runs out, we just got to quickly run to the back to do something." I was like, "Yeah, sure." So <laughs> so I went straight into the booth, um, and they had they used to like cart around these huge crates of records, like vinyl records, like about eight or nine of them, and um, and I just was like, started going through their records. I was like, oh my God, it's like really, it's like, it's like my record collection. But it was the, also the connection was the variety of music, you know, it was, mm-hmm. you know, it was, um, it wasn't just one kind of thing. And it's amazing when you, when you kind of come across people like that in whatever kind of creative field that you're in, because like a lot of the time the creative fields are, you know, there's a lot of like fences or borders within them, you know, because well, it's easier to survive if you fence yourself in really, because people know what they are, you know, they know what they're booking if they're on that side. Yeah. And... It, there, there's also gatekeepers mm. to those things as well. People do guard their corner and, you know, they're very specific about who comes in and who doesn't. And, mm. you know, when we kind of 
when we were at that point in time, you know, we hated all that stuff. You know, there shouldn't be gatekeepers. You know, gates are there to be to be blown off. You know, it's like they're not there to be. Uh, you know, like everyone should have a voice in what yeah. they're looking to do, and people can if they if they like it, they can they can be part of it. If they don't, that's fine. You know. Well, let's uh, get started on the studio building. Okay. So the first thing we ask, and again, this is probably going to be influenced by your entire career in the music industry, but okay. where in the world would you put your dream studio? I'd be in London, 100%. 100% in London? London, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, L- London is, is. Um, I mean, now that you said that, now I'm just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> it could Classic. be anywhere, anywhere. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, uh, no, it would be London. I, I feel it'd be London because ideally it would be somewhere that I could I could go to frequently far more frequently than i'm able to even now you know um and london's my home you know i'm very much a. I was born in london um i'm very much influenced by london a lot of you know all, you know a, a lot of my, my my friends are here um so would you would when you say london now obviously london's a big place are you thinking kind of north london definitely yeah. however though i have i would say i've worked in studios all over london and i've always enjoyed traveling to studios like I've always like for some reason you know when we're like putting a project together or whatever and it's like what studio can we use and and um and part of the journey I think it's quite important when you go to a studio because you're kind of like there's a little bit of preparation that you kind of do in your head or whatever and and that differs to like if you're driving to a studio if you get in the tube to studio you know so I mean for instance um I used uh flood studio mm. Nice. for the um the second ride album that i did and the dran dran um recordings and that is assault and battery yeah. and that's that's only like a 20 minute drive from from where i am yeah. you know so that was that was kind of like a um, great place as well yeah it was yeah. absolutely great it, and also it's such a great and like creative environment like when i was there you know there'd be like alan mold be downstairs and mm-hmm. Or it would be like Flood, who's, he, you know, he, whoever he would be working with and he'd be, you know, going into the kitchen and bumping into, you know, some really amazing, inspiring people, you know. So do, do you, for the, for that those projects specifically, do you get to choose the studio or the, yeah, so. Yeah. I so mean, for I, the Duran Duran project, that was your yeah, decision. Yeah, because for that one, my, my opening kind of um, uh, f- feeling towards the whole thing was that, I, I really wanted to capture the rhythm section live. So I really wanted a great sounding live room. I wanted live drums. I didn't want it to be done in a control room. Had they recorded know. there before? No. Did you feel any pressure in like that choosing and it not because it it'd be quite easy to go, we'll do Abbey Road or we'll do somewhere fancy that's Duran Duran, you know. Yeah, I mean I really liked it because I mean I've 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 known Flood for a while and um I've he's always been super super supportive towards me and as 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 Alan Mulder as well so I, I really like that environment mm. I, I thought it was a really great environment to take a band into um and I also felt that what was there you know with the um with the uh they, they got the old desk from that East uh, Wessex Studios in there um and they Is it uh, big SSL no it wasn't it's uh I think it's an Amec, I think it might okay. be Amec. It's the one that ne- never mind the bollocks. Last was, time I was uh, there, it was the, it had like a red, red leather. Everything was red in there. Ooh. I think it was before. Flood. How long ago was there? Long time. Oh right, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, red, they had red NS tens and red oh, and like cool. a red leather wrist thing on the desk. I can't remember what the desk was, but yeah, the whole room was red. But it was actually kind of a cool thing. Mm. So I like red rooms. Yeah. Um, so basically, um, yeah, which, and, and also you know, he has a whole load of amazing synthesizers in there as well, which mm. I knew like Nick would really appreciate being around, as as would I. Um, and uh, and it was also a place which was kind of uh, everyone could kind of reach within reason. Yeah, you know, it's also important to make sure that you know everyone is not put out by getting there. Yeah, yeah. You know, they you can't, can't arrive selfish fresh. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't a selfish decision. I did actually. I was aware of where everyone would be and traveling yeah. into it and stuff like that. So, um, but I just thought it was a fantastic environment to to take a band like that into. You know, for sure. Um, 
And uh, as the same with Ride as well. We, we, we tracked all the drums for the second Ride album I did in there was as that well. that before Duran Duran? So that's why yeah. you knew it was a great sounding live room as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And also, and also, you know, the engineers who work there as well, you know, that's also a reason to, to go to somewhere as well because, oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's how comfortable, you, you know, you feel somewhere as well, the relationship you have with them, all those things, you know. Them like, understanding kind of, what you're trying to get out of a sound as well like in yeah. terms of miking and things like that. yeah yeah exactly so it would be so the dream studio would be um would be in london i would probably say i would say like you know my, my favorite studios that i've used in london i mean there's something about it i just said uh, i really love conk as well um dan and cratch end uh there's something just particularly um just old school about it it's got it's kind of amazing like it's like step, stepping into the past, you know, mm. you know, but in a really positive. But we're thinking really North way. London, and what kind of what kind of vibe? So, like, how how do you like your environment? Is it kind of well? If I could build a studio um, myself, it would be geared around having a great sounding live room. Obviously, I'd, I would take from all the kind of environments that I'd that I've um, that so I've a live room inspired by. Assault and Battery, battery. inspired by a bit of Conk. A bit of it, uh, Conk, I I think Conk and Assault and Battery have two of the best sounding live rooms that I've used. I mean, The Garden as well, which used to be uh, Matt Johnson's, uh, which is now a... uh, it's now a storeroom for Pret Manger, I think. Um, <laughs> a great <laughs> sounding storeroom. Was a fantastic <laughs> sounding storeroom. Um, um, that was also that was also brilliant as well. Like those those three rooms were. You should get amongst the sandwiches. <laughs> jump it in there as like a promo video that'd be quite yeah. nice yeah <laughs> so if you had to pick one just then. removing sandwiches to get the acoustics right <laughs> one yeah. sandwich at a time wow that's Watch. that's true acoustic dis- yeah. absorption just open that packet actually the, the <laughs> bread's quite more tuna actually <laughs> oh god yeah <laughs> so would you steal one of those rooms or would you kind of take elements of each of them um i think i like the kind of compact nature of conch it's kind of like okay. narrow along and at the end there's a little where, where the old control room used to be mm-hmm. they've got a piano in there they've got a grand piano in there this was the last time i was here last time i was there so it might change since then um and then uh i i liked how it was it was big but it was just still small enough to feel vibey like not yeah cavernous mm. you know and yeah. i and i like how i actually like how when you're like not when you don't have too many options, you have to think on your feet. You have to think creatively because I think that's when you sometimes get the most interesting results. Well, like, you know, setting up an amp in the toilet and then, you know, you realise that there's a shower in there as well. And so you think, God, what would happen if I put, you know, open the door a little bit, put a mic in there against the wall and you yeah. get some insane like slap delay thing to the guitar sound that you wouldn't have got if you'd have set it up in the wooden box that's been designed for it. That's been you know perfectly kind of like treated for there not to be any reflections or something you know what i mean it's like that's how you get original sounds as well exactly and sometimes you know when you're talking about music or if you're you know if you're kind of like sitting with someone who's remotely interested in hearing these things and you're talking about how certain sounds have been you know achieved you go oh yeah that sound that's we did that by doing you know doing this or whatever or and it and it kind of you know there was one later peer thing i remember when we tried to like create a re- reverb chamber by holding a, like a like a practice amp into the air conditioning and then finding the other part of where the air conditioning was <laughs> at the other part of the studio to mic it up from there you know it didn't work but you know you these inspiring things i think uh what give you what, what make a little bit of difference yeah yeah you know and it's to, all those yeah those, that, those energy and that that excitement that goes into it it's a yeah. bit like a bigger version of the cooper time cube that the garden hose <laughs> you know it's like <laughs> the one with the garden hose in it but like even bigger version yeah. but like so that's one of those weird experiments have you got any other weird experiments you did in the studio to kind of yeah lo- oh god um um i mean there's loads of things like um i mean maybe it's not weird but like you know when uh, there's a like the the Hoxton Square. There's a studio there, the local studio there where we did like two doors down. I remember I'd I'd kind of like I'd, I'd, a few weeks before I'd I'd seen um, a documentary about uh, I can't remember what Bowie song it was on, but I think Tony Visconti set up a series of microphones um, along a corridor mm-hmm. that would that were gated and would open up 
based on the uh, how hard a snare was hit. Maybe. Recorded in Hansa, Tom Studio. That, was that one? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so, you know, you try your own version of that. <laughs> I, I didn't even mean that wasn't prepared. I just, just so happens. You might have had a Pret-a-Manger like T-shirt. I've, got a pre- I've actually got a Pret T-shirt on, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what? It's not, like, a lot of it's not a studio. That room is now a ballroom. So, oh right, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Same thing. Sorry, yeah. that was weird. But yeah, <laughs> wasn't but, expecting to do that. Yeah, but you know, you, you kind of like get these. Um, you know, you you'll hear about how something is done. You try your own version of it. You know, and somewhere, you know, you'll get a different result, obviously. But it's the it's the inspiration. You know, it's that kind of like wow. Rather than using, you know, adding a reverb to something or you know, like like uh, double tracking it or whatever, we try this idea. And you know, we did that. Mm. We did it on two doors down actually. Um, I think it's on the. Uh, on the snare on the chorus. I think we did it on there. And I love the sound actually, of that record. Thank mm-hmm. you. Might have actually taken the snare and doubled it, double tracked it in the corridor mm. and recorded it from, you know, from there. Or might have like um might have uh, reamped it. Something like that. But um well gosh. let's um let's hit that point. You said you like limitations. Uh, yeah, which, okay. uh, so, so this is gonna be perfect let's, for let's you. Let's lock in that the, the location. We're in North London with a great yeah. sounding live room. You're essentially stealing conk. Yeah. At the um, moment. Or are you a bit of conk. I'd I'd steal a bit of I would actually also steal a bit of thing from Assault and Battery in the sense where there's other studios in there. There's just something that kind of brings you out of your out of your world a little bit when you bump into other people in a corridor or if you're like you know or if someone else calls you in and says hey can i get your opinion on something or i want to play you something or something like that i i, I don't yeah. know for me that's really that's really nourishing you yeah, know yeah. Mm. rather than just being like completely closed off you yeah. know i mean yeah i mean i spend a lot of time doing a lot of stuff on my own you know so mm. you know it'd be great to have the opportunity for there to be just other people around as well right so, well let's yeah, lock that in that. and then we'll move on your three free items. The three free items. Yeah. So a computer, a DAW, and an audio interface. Okay. That's kind of easy. Yeah. Part, okay. Uh-huh. So the computer's easy. Yeah. Um, and I could be quite specific about which one as well, because up until... Spectrum 48. <laughs> <laughs> yes. With an Amiga yeah. lights on the side. Um, uh, it, would be, um, it would be the new Mac Mini M2. Okay. The new one. But and I would say this to anybody who's on the lookout for these because I speak to a lot of people and um, I used to have a an old cheese grater, you know, the Mac Pros, mm-hmm. since like 2010 or something, and I um, I completely like like what do you call it? Fully load is that fully yeah. load the term? Spec'd you know, it out. Yeah. Spec'd it out. Like I had yeah. the most RAM you could put in it. I yeah. had like each chassis had a hard drive in it, and I was running everything off the board and uh-huh. rather than externally, and you know, so that kind of thing. So. Um, uh, that got to the point where you just couldn't move up OSs and it meant that, you know, some specific bits of software weren't working anymore and it just got to the point where like I'd even I'd even It like, was time. It was time. But I mean I even I even forced the firmware upgrade on it. Like you could only go up to like if I'm right, I think it only goes up to one point two on the firmware, but I found a workaround to get up to one point three, which meant you could still go up a few more OSs. Right. So I don't know if the it's old Spectrum acceptable. hacker coming yeah, back out. This is yeah. It. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's yeah, it's somewhere on the internet that some people wrote some code to do that, and I did that, and I got it up another bit of the firmware, which is totally safe, and I managed to get up another OS, which meant that a couple of other things started working. But then, you know, it was just it was just like banging your head off a wall, really. And so I thought it's time to upgrade. And I did my research as to what of the new Macs I could go up to, because you, you know part of you is thinking. I'm just going to get the the fastest Mac that I can mm. because it's going to future proof you. But that's not necessarily the case in this because people are talking about getting like the Macs, the Studio One, yeah. which is more for like. Well, I was going like, to say we graphic. should upsell dreams here, surely. From a we could upsell your dreams. Upsell your dreams. Upsell your dreams to a Mac Studio. I don't want it. Don't want it. No. Okay. So tell because us why. I don't want it because like I don't need it. I mean, so this is what I did. I, and I'd recommend this to anybody out there who wants to basically get a really good machine mm-hmm. that's going to be super fast and really great value. I got whatever that Mac Mini M2 is, that's like 1,400 quid. I think 16 gig- gigabyte, mm-hmm. and I think it's 500 uh, gigabyte um, hard drive, net, hard, disk, hard drive yeah, right? SSD, yeah. I got one of those. And um, then you can get these chassis, right, for like 99 pounds, mm-hmm. uh, which sit underneath, and it basically expands 
the connectivity. Yeah. It gives you some USB outs and stuff on the front, SD and stuff like that. But there's also a little bit in there where you can um, put, and this is what I did, I put a two terabyte like little drive in there and it's literally on the board because it's connected by USB-C. So you've got a load of like space and you know, for the for, for what you're paying for, for that machine, you know, it's going to last you about 10 years or something. And is portability feel, important to you then? You need to be able, do you need to be able no, to take that? No, because I've, I've technically got three studios right. at home. So, um, and believe it or not, I'm about to set up a fourth and you're going to laugh as to what the fourth one is. Go on. Is it? Is it an Amiga 500? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell is you it how really? Yeah, it is, yeah. So basically I've got, um, so I've got my main studio, which is geared around this m2 mm -hmm. i've got another studio in my record room where i keep all my vinyl and i kind of start a lot of stuff in as well just i like kind of being quite relaxed about being creative i don't want to sit down and be like i've got to do something i like just opening stuff up and noodling and then noodling happens, and yeah. then seeing what happens yeah a lot of stuff starts off in there mm -hmm. um but they're all they're all kind of linked in some way like you know i can save a project there and i can put it into the studio and carry on there and stuff so um and that's just another like i said 2020 mac like it's not the m2 one but it works fine and then my laptop now I've, I've i kind of went against everything i said about working on laptops but i i i'm kind of also happy to work on a laptop on a plane or in a hotel room or something like that to kind of start an idea or whatever i, I, don't, I don't really like laptops for music because i kind of equate laptops with email and kind of more admin based kind of stuff still um, the same for djing as well no laptop dj oh no, no i've never taken no. a laptop into a nightclub no never same um, same <laughs> and the fourth one is i thought you know what, i've got this old sampler and i've got my amiga so i've still got like all the software um and a friend of mine actually a, a neighbor who's uh who's who's an equal uh geek in this way um i was chatting to him and and he had a um a little box which where you can convert the like RF output of the Amiga to HDMI. Yeah. Okay. So I can plug it into like a new screen. So I just thought I just I just open it up and just see what I went down this like. road with the Commodore sixty four and the Prophet sixty four cartridge with MIDI and Did you? they they made a modern software for the Commodore sixty Commodore sixty four where it had a sequencer, a three oh three clone, all using the SID chips and you could stack the SID chips in the sixty four to get more, you know, power. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but it it was for me. It was a bit of a one of those holes you go down. And go, why am I doing this? Yeah. I'm not making any music. Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I I thought the same as well. I'm like, why am I doing this? Yeah. But then I thought, if it's just gonna be an afternoon of just you know just you know just opening up a hit and yeah. hearing it, seeing it, and stuff like that, then it's it's fine. You know what I mean? I'm just like, it um, was fun when it was set up and it was kind of cool. And you work in different ways when you're wrestling with old like uh, you know the interface of a Commodore 64 or whatever, yeah. and it gives you. It coughs out different ideas, and yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah, and I've got the old MIDI, I've got the, the MIDI like box, yeah. the digitizer, mm. and stuff like that. And I just That's thought, really cool. I mean, I, I don't know, I just, I just thought, well, why not? So, but for your dream studio, we're just locking in that Mac yeah. Mini, Mac, a, the, Mac, the Mac Mini, yeah. I mean, it's just worked, it's been so smooth, you know, and it, nothing is a strain on it. And I, and I like that, you know, I, I like, you know, if I switch something. On, I need it to be working there and then and stuff. I just I'm very very impatient in that way. So you well, know, let's, let's move on to your mm. the, get through these free items: the interface and the yeah. DAW. Interface would be um, this is fantasy. Don't forget, you can go big. I could go big. I mean, see, I the interfaces that I've I've, I've loved. I, I really loved my RME 800. It's a popular I really choice. Loved it. Um, however. Mm. due to uh, Firewire technology no longer being supported by Apple, it will not work with my Mac Mini. And however fantastical this studio is... They have a new one, new, new um, RMEs, don't they? Yes, they do. And also they have this cool box, this link box, where you can like link up like 56 um, uh, channels or um, ins and outs, all by ADAP. Oh, it's ADAT. Ad 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I've got these. Uh, actually, I can, I can veer off on a slight tangent here because this week I actually spent um, uh, upgrading the power supplies in my Apogee sound cards, um, 
and because they're 20 years old, you can't actually find an exact fit for it. So the nearest fit that I could find, which came all the way from America, um, was the right footprint, was the right um, voltage, everything, you know. Um, however, it was two millimeters too high for me to put the lid on. So we had to act, at angle grind the heat pads on the top and then put washers on the top to actually have it sit on there. That was what my Monday was. <laughs> So doing that instead of like maybe just going, this has seen the best of the day. Let's move on to another. No, I'm a interface. big believer in recycling things. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, and right also on. I, I they, they work mm. and they sound great. And, you know, you know, the equivalent to go out now, you'd be spending like, you know, two grand on each unit, mm. you know, to do that. And um, and they and they sound great. and They work, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of I'm really loyal to the gear that works for me. You know, I don't really, you know, like something replacing something else has to really has to it has to really be time for it like the computer you know mm. um because i, I suppose I, I get really i get very stuck in my um in my ways with well it, and it's so. risky changing things when it's yeah. working and when you know when you're yeah. used to a process and a workflow and you're having success from it you know and it's your job mm -hmm. and your career yeah. it's like is this going to set me back months yeah you know that's why people don't change. upgrade i mean yeah. I'm, I'm putting off upgrading endlessly mm -hmm. yeah but in terms of your Interface, what you're going to Interface, what's it going to be? Um, I have to press you on this. Are you, I'm, I'm really climatized to using the UAD. Okay. Hey, card. Plugins. Oh, plugins. Oh, uh, uh, hang on, hang on. No, 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 but they come with the card, right? The ones that come with the card, don't Just yeah. the ones that come yeah. with that yeah. particular. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the, so basically, any excuse for I, I, I get the <laughs> best, the best Apollo that you could probably get. Okay. okay. Whatever that one Do you that care is. about Pre's or no? Yeah, I, I like the Pre's on the Apollo. It's the 8 Pre, is it? The X8. X8P. Would be uh, the... What's the one above that? If it's fact, what's the most expensive one you can get from UAD? I think the Apollo 16 is the biggest one, but it doesn't have any Pre's on it. I'll stick to what I know then. I'll, I'll stick to the 8. The 8 XP, is it? Yeah, XP. Okay. And then the DAW then of choice. This is the free item. You can select more things when we get to your six okay, items. Got it. Yeah, okay, yeah, 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 sure. Okay, well, um, all right. So I use, um, whenever I work with bands, I use Pro Tools, mm -hmm. basically. it's I find it for audio, for tracking, for the emulation of tape as such, you know, and editing. It's... I, I'm I'm just climatized to that really now from like you know and I um, guess from working in other studios when when you go to most studios that must be the default yeah absolutely going yeah. mm -hmm. for conk absolutely and battery assault and battery yeah exactly so like I have I have recorded like bands in in Logic before but like I don't know I'm just used to Pro Tools for that because the Mystery Jets was a a, a, a balance of both wasn't it because no Mystery Jets was all was all Pro Tools. Um, but we use actually probably some logic because we did that across nine different studios. Yeah, I, I think because I interviewed you back in the day, and I think because yeah. I remember that little bell sound on two doors down was uh, the logic. Oh yeah, synth. That, that was that was the logic synth. Yeah, but yeah. we we um we literally like um and then and some later peer stuff was like like PC synths as well. But we would just like do the three point five mil jack out <laughs> mm -hmm. straight into the desk yeah. like and then into tools. Yeah, that's nice. it. Yeah, yeah um, it use it like an instrument. But um anyway, sorry, back to Pro Tools. Yeah, I mean. Pro Tools is what I would use to record bands, but um, Fantasy I, use, I, I use Logic more, really. I do use Logic more, especially for MIDI stuff and for remixing. Um, and I found that if you'd asked me this like 10 years ago, I'd, I'd say Pro, Pro Tools in that yeah. sense, but um, but uh, I think Logic has has kind of take, like kind of, it, it's, it, it's a lot, I don't know, I've always like better in a way because I've always I've always used it as well. I've always liked it, but but um, but I'm super comfortable with it now yeah. for whatever kind well, of thing. It's, I need it's to things do like it. that. It's sometimes a combination of you getting more comfortable with it and the software mm. itself getting better. Yeah, so it's like yeah, yeah. It's yeah. caught up in a lot of ways. But like in terms of the remixing, then yeah. you said it. You prefer it for remixing. What is it specifically about Logic that, um, that works for you? Basically, just being able to, uh, for instance, for example, like if you bring the stems in of the remix that you're working on, and then you want to then uh, sync a load of outboard stuff to play alongside it, so you can jam it out and record it back in, or you know, writing MIDI mm. and all that kind of stuff. Um, and things like latency and and whatnot, you know. I just I guess just, for warping stuff as well now with the. Yeah, and actually, you know what I, yeah. I, I got to say, you know, um, you know, I don't, I, 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 I didn't have a, uh, I didn't have a, 
uh, I think I used to have like a waves, um, uh, like pitch shift correction thing on my old computer. But then since you went to a new one and you can't, you couldn't take your waves with you mm-hmm. on the stuff. I, I was then, um, so wave goodbye. I wave. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> oh I, uh, I, um, nice. Nice. It's very good. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, um, I didn't have like auto tune or anything. So, um, and someone said, oh, why don't you just use one in Logic? It's really good. I was like, oh, right. I didn't know there was one. So, and then they told me where it was and it, it was great. I was like, mm. it's so easy. Yeah. yeah. Like, I have something on board, you know, that's not a third party thing. That, that isn't even a plugin. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like in the interface. So the door, yeah. it would be Logic. Okay. Mm-hmm. We'll lock those in and then we'll start on your, these are your six items now. Yeah. Okay. So item number one. Okay. Um... Item number one. Think about what you've got already as well. Okay, recently I kind of was doing a lot of stuff in the box, mm-hmm. um, just just for sheer um, convenience. And I, I I mixed something at my friend's studio, a uh, guy called uh, Yeston Paulson, who's got uh, space in Strong Rooms, mm-hmm. One Room Strong Rooms, uh, Mirror Studios. Mm-hmm. And um, we were kind of like doing a bit of a shootout between like sound cards um, and converters and um using his summing mixer and just the just i I'd, i had forgotten you know and i take it for granted the fact that it no matter how good your mix sounds digitally when you do kick it out into a summing mixer um through good converters and stuff and come back in and you do that properly it always sounds that just that little bit better yep. and and i have got a Chandler uh, TGI mixer, mm, which nice. I used to use on everything, like everything that went through my studio went through that, and I stopped using it. And I was like, uh, "Why?" <laughs> it's going through transformers mm, and yeah. circuitry, which yeah. which kind of like can give you um, a little better separation, arguably. Right. Um, can give it just a bit of a, a bit of a tonal like focus mm. you know i mean there's lots of different ways you can do this as well even if you don't have a summing mixer one thing that um steve dub um uh told me uh, taught me when we were mixing the beyond the whist sleeve album together right was um what we were doing is when we had all the stems ready we were literally just passing like 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 the sums like the drums the bass the guitar the vocals through a culture vulture but the culture of Archer wasn't really doing anything. It was like you'd listen to it and you you you'd toggle it and it's minor, 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 minor amount of whatever. But just from doing that, it just kind of it just does something. It mm. kind of you can say maybe shaves off a few of the something at the very top and very bottom or whatever, or it just focuses it in. And uh and you and then when you kind of bring it back in, you listen to it, it sounds a little bit different. It sounds a bit more open. At one point, um, uh, I think might have done it on some of the Mystery Jet things did, did um, and late, late appear as well, but uh, we'd do like the stem mixes. Mm. You, know, you do a mix, you put it down at the tape or whatever, and then you'd run off all the stems. And then we used to then do a digital bounce of the stems as they were sitting, you know, in the project, like, eight channels or whatever eight or so channels mm. and then go between that and the bounce that we'd done the summed bounce and that would sound different as well yeah, yeah. you know yeah. and we ended up sometimes like using that version because there was just a little bit more space in it somehow i i really you know if i was to be pushed to explain the science on it i don't think i could like convincingly mm. but you know i trust my ears which is i think all you can do in this you know, in this game, you know, so, um, yeah, I, I, I found that, you know, so, so sometimes you'll, you'll do these kind of things and it's a little bit, you know, not what you would expect, but it sounds, it sounds get, good. Get- you know, what's really important as well is to, is, um, you know, if it sounds right, it's right, yeah. you know, and also the, the whole thing, meat quote, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. if it sounds right, it is right. But yeah. also, you know, it's, um, you know, not to get too, you know, bogged down in stuff because I, I i tend to find that some people can kind of really uh that he can kind of like extinguish the excitement 
from what they're doing by kind of going too deep into that thing of like oh it's this or it's that or i haven't got this or whatever and it's just like me on really... the commodore 64 that was the, the <laughs> all yeah. excitement was this. <laughs> you need you need to make sure that you're kind of moving into what you're doing yeah you yeah. know that's really really important um so if i but, one are we thinking this chandler then is that what i, I would going? definitely go for chandler yeah i definitely go for chandler upsell your dream i'm gonna upsell you don't you actually really want an EMI TG12345 mixing console? The real thing. The real thing. You could have the real thing from Abbey Road. Oh, God, I could, can I? <laughs> I could, yeah. Why am I being so, like, loyal well, here? That's why we're here. <laughs> Upsetting no, dreams. I mean, Chandler okay. do great gear, and it's yeah. all based on this stuff. But you could go... But can we just also address something about, about like, if you were to say to me, you know, I'll give you a, a, a new korg ms20 so the new one i've got or you can have an old vintage one yeah or you offer me um you know uh an arp 2600 a new one mm -hmm. or an old one yeah i would probably go for the new one why because i feel that um i've got a lot of old stuff and it keeps going wrong and it keeps it it, hold, it slows me down. It holds me back. And some of the things, like the Korg MS Twenty new one, and like for example, the Monopoly clone that I've got, I think sounds as good. Mm. You know, I mean, fair play to the, the the new Pro One copies that they've made. I've got a lot of people who have had Pro Ones for a very long time, and they're mm. super, super, super. Um, picky about what yeah. they like what they don't like yeah and they're like it's as good and yeah, wow. i think that and it only has to get so close uh, then you have the reliability factor and it's like the reliability oh, there, is really important yeah. i mean i you know like every time a vintage synth breaks down and it's months you know, right to go out get send it off somewhere and it costs you half the value of the synth to get back and yeah. whatever one and of the not... five people in the uk that can actually repair it as well yeah, exactly yeah. and also if you're one of the few people who can afford to do that as yeah, well yeah. you know it's like it's i i love vintage gear you know i've got an old polyvox synth that um that uh like runs on diesel you know what i mean and it's kind of like it doesn't it doesn't know yeah. what it wants to make what kind of sound it wants to make you know it, it's yeah. got a mind of its yeah. own and i love that for that and I don't, I don't want that to be reliable. But mm. there's certain things that I need to be reliable. Yeah. You know. So I think it's mixing and matching on these things. But taking on an old EMI, yeah, but it's taking a forever on, studio. You forever have. studio, but it is you know like keeping it maintained. Yeah. Well, yeah. we do actually have a forever studio maintenance tech, yeah, tech, tech. who's available. <laughs> yeah. Twenty four seven. Twenty four seven. Yeah. Okay. In that case. <laughs> <laughs> does that change things in that, for you? it does change it yeah because you know you want you know um if these things are going to work mm, you yeah, know yeah. when they need to work mm. then yeah if it's a, if, if we're if we're fantasizing here yeah then absolutely you know what if we're talking about rather than you, you're right actually why don't i just go for a neve desk instead if there's gonna be a tech around a neve vr because that the one they had in the garden was the one that we, we mixed uh, Fantasy Black Channel on. No, we didn't. We mixed that in the strong rooms. Um, was it a Neve? They had a Neve. They had a Neve VR in the strong rooms room one, I yeah. think. One one strong room is a... Uh, yeah, I think one's a Neve and one's an SL, right? In strong room. Yeah, VR60. Yeah, VR60. Strong room yeah. one, yeah. Yeah, that one. That one. And that do you one. want the one from strong room? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah why not? Great. <laughs> Money's no issue. I'm dreaming. <laughs> we had uh, and as a tech, we had the guys from Strong Room on season one, was it? Season one, yeah. Season one. So uh, yeah, we had Jake from from Strong Room. So yeah, sorry, the desk is gone. Right, that's it. Item that's number it. two. Let's uh, let's yeah. move on to the next item. Okay. Um, item number two would be you're going to need uh, some monitors. Yeah, then mm. I'd be the Genlec 1031 As. Bam! Look at that straight away. Yeah, because I I, I love Genlec monitors, and I'll tell you why because um they're really great to um write with they're, they're really great to um they're really flattering so whatever you're doing sounds and feels good and it keeps inspiring you to keep going and and also you know that i, I really love mixing on them but obviously i have other speakers as well that i kind of go between 
but those are the main ones and uh, and i think when you go down the range of or up the range of general x as well they sell they stay quite consistent that's what i like about them like if you work somewhere even on the little ones bro- like on sort of the broadcast style radio studio ones mm. they just sound like the big ones but without the low end or you know they yeah. don't they don't change significantly from uh, across the range they sort of yeah pretty consistent so if you yeah. can work on one set you can generally work on a lot of them yeah. like if you go to other people's places yeah. and you know what i actually got into genlex because um through the generosity of dave and steph solwax back in like 2004 i think it was when um i just said to them like i said uh oh you know i i, I, I don't have any monitors like what do you think i should what do you think i should try to get I didn't know where to start with monitors, you know. Um, and they just, oh, hey, we've we got some Genlex you can use. And they brought them over from Belgium. Yeah, you know, this is, but they're super, super yeah. generous and kind mm-hmm. like that, you know. They're sort of, and I was, I was Have like, you got really? any of their other kit Probably. in play? Right? I was going to say, yeah, we had I them had on the since. podcast and they kept forgetting that they had kit in like Australia or, oh, didn't we lend that to? <laughs> it's in a warehouse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's in a warehouse. I'm yeah, I, I, I had their Chroma, their Fender Chroma. Yes, a few a couple of years ago, and also there was another synth as well. Oh, nice I had one. a I had a string machine, a Logan string machine of theirs as well, which oh, okay. I used loads yeah. on loads of things. Um, but you know, it was there and it was looked after and it, it was used. And um, and then when they'd finally remembered I'd had it, I was like, Oh yeah, yeah, oh that that's yours. Is it? <laughs> <I'm joking. laughs> no, um, no, I did actually tell them it was it. But also with the Genlex as well. Like I mean, you know, I had them for for years, and I was like, Hey, I've still got your Genlex. Like so when I got the bigger ones. Um, because it was the 1030s. Yeah. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, I kind of, I really liked how they sounded and I got used to them. And every time I'd go into a studio, I'd make sure, you know, that they had Genlex up mm. as well alongside whatever else they had. So even if they had like... They became your NS10. Well, there was always yeah. NS10 there right. mm. as well. Um, always, to be honest, if you, in like tracking stuff, you kind of um, set it up on the NS10s, yeah. mm. really. And then switch to the Gen Lex. So can we? There must be some more upselling of dreams here. Gen Lex ten thirty one A's, and also they're discontinued, I believe. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah. But I know that they do the ones. They do ones where they like correct to the room. The the SAMs that we've had those on before. The ten thirty twos, the SAM monitors. They're much bigger, aren't they? Um, good question. No, they look about the same size, but um. I, I could be wrong there. Yeah. Um, do you want to just go with the ones you like? You can just keep the ones I mean, you like. Can you, is there... How? Okay, shall we show in a picture now for those uh, listening? Okay. The, the, I mean, but they're the, they're the square ones as well. They're not the, the, yeah. the egg-shaped Genelex either. Oh, I've I, I got to say, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of egg-shaped things. I've got, <laughs> just generally? That, I like um, eggs. What, like, what about eggs? <laughs> I've got an egg-shaped air fryer at the moment. And oh. I was thinking of switching it for a more rectangular-shaped thing. I just, I don't know why. I've just, I'm just... I, I Did you I, watch I, Alien as a child? Maybe. <laughs> that it? it might be that. I don't know. It's... um Those uh, those egg monitors you would have hated then. They, oh. What are they? Who are they? Are those were Monroe. Monroe, Monroe Sonic. Yeah. Monroe Sonic eggs. Right. Egg-shaped speakers. Yeah. Apparently good because of the acoustics, right? Because they... That was the theory, yeah. yeah. I've got JR149s as well, which are the cylinders. You know, those cylinders? Oh, yeah. Those are my hi-fi. Um, but they're based on the old BBC monitors. Okay, um, so we're going to look... Genelec 10, Genelec. 31, let's just go with it, I think. Yeah, because, love it. You know. We can always... When we go back, you can, you'll can you hear it and you'll... Yeah, so I'm active like to, as well, well, so I don't need to choose an amp as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So item number three then. Okay, so I built a compressor. Mm-hmm. Or I had a compressor built for me. Um, it was basically an SSL clone. Okay. It was on. It was a. Uh, um, it was built by a, a guy Pom, who okay. built the boiler. Oh, the guy who does the Pom Childs. Yeah, yeah. Fairchild's clones. Yeah. yeah. So he did. He built me a compressor. I said to him, "I want an SSL compressor on steroids." Um, and he built. He built it for me. Um, only equipment and things are allowed to be on steroids as a good thing. <laughs> Whereas humans, it's seen as a bad thing, isn't it? Generally, Nobody goes, yeah. I want, like... It depends he, on the community. He's like a normal human, but on steroids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody says that. <laughs> but with yeah. gear and stuff, yeah. it's uh, acceptable. Yeah. yeah. They yeah. Go, what what kind of be... gear are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> on steroids. On steroids. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Sorry. Aaron. It was, like, supercharged. Like, yeah. Um, it, just, it was just, like, you know, the spinal tap of compressors, you know, it went Love to it. 11. Yeah, sort of yeah. So, yeah. Um, 
Um, and also he put a Neve uh, width, width module on it because when you go all the way to the right and you get the complete, just the phase signal, you can then hear your clocking. So if back then, if it, if things were, this is when computers were a lot, it was built in like 2000. Six or this seven, two thousand eight, two thousand six, seven, eight, so like that. Mm -hmm. If it if it was if you didn't have right, you can it still sounds digital and fragmented and stuff, and you can hear that in the in the sides, like right. more so than in the middle sort of thing. So you okay. go all the way. I mean, it never really sounded like that to me, but apparently that's what it did. And it was called uh, the Mustafa SSL three thousand or four thousand or something like that. It was based on an SSL uh, four hundred circuit, I believe. Um, Wow, and um, and you know it's my own compressor. Um, I actually had another one. I had one. I think I had, had one made for Dave and Steph as well. Yes, yeah, so I think there's one sitting in their studio as well. Yeah, do we? I mean, you know, if I, if I'm coming out the Chandler, or in this case, it would still be no, it'd be the Neve now. Near the Neve. I was coming out the Neve. Neve yeah. It'd be that'd be across it. You know. And so it's a what like a G series bus compressor? Are we talking or is yeah, it uh, a channel la, la, compressor? La, la. It's based on the 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 outboard SSL compressor. Oh, so just a stereo compressor. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Got, it's got not got based it. on a de it's not a desk one. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, it's but it's it's got more oomph to it if you need it. I don't know how I did it, but put some it's a extra high powered caps in there or something. So nice. he's a clever bloke as well. That's very nice clever stuff. bloke. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, he's he. I mean, I've, I, I've he's built me a whole bunch of things like i would mm. sometimes find junk like in a, in a in a in a junk shop you know just some valves or whatever like on their own and i'd be like can you like turn this into something i could pass audio through and stick an eq on it and he'd be like yeah sure and he'd do it <laughs> put the box I've, I've got i've just got loads of handmade stuff in my Amazing. studio um just because you just come across things and it's like well what would happen if you just put sound through it you know yeah. what would it sound mm. like i've got an old 50s um um what is it it's it's some kind of amp and it's three valves in there and so there are three different types of distortions yeah. so we just like turn it into a distortion unit you know so i've got about half a dozen things that are handmade in my studio amazing that's um, very cool and and they've been used on stuff you know you'll just be like well you know just whack the drums through that or you know i just find it as as you know you know when people say oh you know if you stick like your drums through like an old like ems like synthy or whatever it mm. sounds great you know it's like yeah you just you're just putting it through some circuitry and you yeah. like how it sounds on the other end yeah it's just the same principle you know if you haven't got an eight grand 60s <laughs> synthesizer you might have a something that you found in a junk shop that will give you something different whether you use it or not is up to you you know yeah. but to have the opportunity you know, I think I think well, cool. you've got two items left okay. uh, on the uh, three. studio gear. Sorry, three, three, three yeah, items yeah. left. Yeah, three items left. Yeah. So we're going with the SSL, the Mustafa yeah. SSL. So three items. 3, are any of the boutique things going to make it onto your yeah. forever studio for item number four? You've got the SSL, but um, item I, number four. I, I mean, that that is the main. That is the main one. I don't think anything else I'd really want to um, take in. But I've already got a Neve desk, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I bought a Trident Flexi Mix in like 2006 I think it was and it's like 22 channel desk of like A class um, double desk I'm liking this so far yeah <laughs> this is insane yeah okay yeah. Um, <laughs> keep going <laughs> it was um, well basically um, it's it's like all like um, it's like the top trident circuits like op amps and stuff in there and eqs and whatever and originally they tried to make these as monitoring desks for queen apparently Oh, wow. And uh, I, I think I believe Dare by the Human League was mixed on one, and I, I also heard I heard conflicting things that Spiders from Mars was also mixed on it as well, mm. but that might not be true. Or maybe part of it was tracked for it. I can imagine it from tracking because of just like, um, yeah, I mean the pre's on it are, are super. And um, but what I did was, I really love hat sounds, but I can't cart a twenty two channel desk to other studios with me mm. so um i had the way the trident flexi mix works is it breaks apart oh nice so you can pull a bucket it's called a bucket mm -hmm. and you can pull a bucket out and it's connected by cards and you've got eight channels so i had a power supply modded onto it put into a flight case 
and I can take it wherever I want to go to. And I've got eight Trident Pre's and EQ's, which you can use alongside anything else. So that is very cool. So would that be your that'd be one? Four? Yeah, because I I I, I love um, I love like Neve Pre's as well, but it's nice to have an option. Yeah, you know. You've only got two items left. I notice you've got a lot of preamps here. You've got preamps in your interface. You've got preamps in your Neve. You've got preamps in the Trident. But you don't have any instruments yet. Or microphones. Or microphones. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. We're getting active. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Um, uh, all right. All right. Okay, so, <laughs> all right. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mild panic setting in. I would... You know what? Um, Microphone-wise... Um, just a good all rounder would probably be. It's definitely what you're going to need. With, yeah, with two <laughs> items left. <laughs> uh, the SM7B. Ah. sure. As we're using right now. As we're Beautiful. using right now. I mean, because it's you know, I would have also said an RE20 as well, because for instru- whatever instrument you want to put that across, that's always it sounds fantastic. I've always loved them. Also, but this is more niche, but. That Coles, and I can't remember the model number of it. It's, but it's the Coles. We, we called it the pterodactyl because it looked like a dinosaur. Um, the sort of egg-shaped one. Not the, the, no, it's not egg-shaped. It's not egg-shaped. Egg <laughs> egg I'm so sorry. Egg. Sorry, sorry. Please stay. It's not, it's not the ribbon. It's not the ribbon. It's yeah. the one that's a cardoid and a ribbon, I believe. Oh, the ball and biscuit thing, is it? No, it's um, it, it, it's uh, it literally looks like a... Like, like a it's like, is it the forty three, forty four, or something like that? Tell us a bit more about your yeah. experience with it. And oh, that was one we'd always we'd always put it on the like in front of a drum kit, and just like compress the hell out of it, and it always sounded great. And you'd kind of you build your drum sound around that a little bit, you know. Point, but it's also yeah, if you yeah. only had like two mics on a kit, you know, I'd 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 want that at the front. You I mean, know, that could be your last two items, those two mics, or are you uh, going to save... Oh, God. Well, I'd, I'd only go for one mic. Okay, really. one mic. Um, yeah, I'd go for one mic. I'd go for um, I'd go for the SM7B, I think, because I think it's just super versatile. and um, That's been a choice before, I think, as well. It's like, yeah, for that reason, it's fine. There's also an Audio-Technica one. If you're on a budget, it's, and I remember I, I remember I had it recommended to me... Um, is it Audio Technica forty forty? Is that? Oh yeah, that, that, that's a up? thing. That's a thing. I think yeah, I had one. That's like a that's, black one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I had very standard looking yeah. condenser, but that's a really, really good all rounder. If you yeah. like, that's the best. Mo- like back when I got one, it's under three hundred just... quid. Is it? So about, about three, three to four hundred quid. That's four, about how much yeah. it cost when I got it. Yeah, about you know, in like uh, you know, probably about almost twenty years ago, maybe you know, mm. or something like that. Um, and that was recommended to me off the back of like. You know, that's the best mic, all rounder mic you can get for under like, you know, maybe eight hundred pounds or something like that. Yeah, and I really like that. I really like, you know, I my all my microphones are a combination of, kind of, um, I've got a Sony that I got apparently used to belong to John Entwistle, um, uh, and the number, the more number, the C800G, the one with the big heat no, it's, sink it's on the a back. Square or... one. It's like a, it's like a, like oh, a okay. something twenty. Oh wow, Sony. Oh, you're really testing. C40? C48s. C48, that's yeah, it. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, C48. But I like, I, you know, I like, you know, like I say, it's, it's a combination of like cheap stuff, you know, and not crazy. I mean, I don't own like a Neumann mic or anything like that. I don't think I could ever justify buying one, to be honest with you, like mm. spending £8,000 on a microphone or something like that. It's just, it's just not in my... Sorry, but like the, uh, it doesn't work for me in that way. I I, I would rather I, I I would have to work with the limitation that I've got. Yeah, you know, if I if I can only get a seven B or an Audio Technica or mm. you know this like Sony thing that I bought off John Ent Whistle, you know, for not much as well. Um, well, let's move on to your final yeah. item. Speaking of limitations again. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> There's not much going on, really. Yeah, there? loads of preamps. Um, um, so far, you're making music forever with Logic and a microphone, essentially, and a lot of preamps. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? I've actually done a lot of stuff in in, in production. I, I use my voice a lot. Like I'll make mm, I'll make okay. sounds with my voice and put it into samplers. Mm. 
and use those for as like pads or percussion even yeah you know um well if the sounds in your head you can nearly get it there can't you i mean within reason right i mean yeah i mean you're never gonna be I, beyonce but like you, yeah you might be able to i mean what kind of noises are you making what, what do oh, you mean loads of you... different things i've um on a mr jets track you know there's a track called valding gray mm -hmm. um on there uh we had like we called them gob hats because i wanted to accentuate the open hi-hat part on the rhythm and i was like yeah i wouldn't be a, a vocal thing so caps was playing the open hi-hat bit on there and we all went around a microphone and we did the tss, tss, tss part to accentuate it mm. and brought that in to me and it kind of it just sounds a little bit it's just you know it's a little bit wonky because the rhythm is kind of wonky so i wanted to kind of push that aspect of it more and um and you know i i i kind of like I, i've done it also with um like pad noises and stuff like you'll have a synth part but then you pick up a mic and then you'll hum the same thing in there then you'd mimic blend it across them together a keyboard, yeah you know filter it off and uh -huh. modulate it a bit and then you get another layer of people i don't think is... people do that this enough because people it's, don't yeah I mean, it's the easiest way to get a unique sound yeah, yeah. of like distance from the mic the mic you're using your own voice I mean, immediately every... there's loads of variables that cannot be recreated yeah. yeah if you listen to the beyond the wizard sleeve mix of um reanimation of the bears are coming by later to appear there's a horn part in there and a big part of that is my voice we had jungle on the podcast <laughs> and we're surprised to hear that a lot of the horns on their yeah. record on, on jungle's record was just yeah. mouth yeah. mouth trumpets yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, there was a bit. I mean, there's a, there's some real horns in there as well. But like, yeah, double that. And, and I, I really love the natural modulation that your voice brings on things. And it, and it's from, I don't know. It's, it's, it's your voice. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's, it's you want to yeah. connect with other humans. Like, use it to your advantage. You know, rather than, you know, synth. You know, you can synthesize stuff, and that that's great. Obviously, you know, I'll get to that for my final thing. Probably some form of synthesis. But like. But I I really like yeah. using my voice in 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 times you know there's yeah well, then synth is going to be the final item is it mm. and what's the old on new uh, you kind of want something versatile as well do you yeah I do you want something polyphonic or is it monophonic I really I tell you what the synth that I that that is my like what I love the most in the studio octave and cat. it's the first synth I bought the octave. <laughs> Cat. Cat. I love it, but it's, yeah. that's got a mind of its own as well. <laughs> right. um, an animal. But I really, I really, like I bought, I bought a Juno Six in like two thousand, uh, two thousand one, for like one hundred and seventy quid at a Blue Audio in Angel. I don't know if you remember that store. That was great. I bought so many cents out of there, and when it closed down, I was, I was gutted because weird it went under selling Junos at one hundred and seventy quid. <laughs> Well, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah hold on, this was not. I no, bought, I know. This I was bought, back in the day. I bought yeah. two arps from there. Bought an arp, an arp avatar, an arp, an arp axe from there. I bought Hofner bass. Um, I bought my um, arp. No, my what did you mention? The, the octave, octave yeah. which apparently used to belong to Dan Donovan from Big Audio Dynamite. <laughs> okay. I only found out who I know as well. So that was kind of funny getting that. Um, the one thing I know I wouldn't get yeah. is one of those huge modulars like the. Well, you'd be uh, that'd like be that. some kind of bundle. That would be a bundle, so you're not allowed no, it anyway. Bundle. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go near it. Okay, good. It's just, it's just like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I have, I, I've, I've haven't really dabbled in that side of things. Mm. To be honest with you, because um, you're talking about the immediacy element as well, yeah. right? Yeah, so, I just don't have the patience. And so, I mean, you said the Juno Six. I just love I just love the voice. I love its voice. I, I, I love the tone of it. It's just really I find it really an emotional synthesizer. Mm. Really. I I don't know, I just really connect. I've always connected with it and I've used it on so many things. Um Again, it's a popular choice because it's it's immediate but it's not limited. Yeah. It's a strange it's a perfect In balance between it not being complicated, but you can get loads of variety yeah. of sound out of it and mm. you can also like you know it's not really known it's not really valued for bass but mm. um for its bass sound as such because people tend to go for moogs and stuff like that or moogs and that for for, for basses but you can get an amazing it's on loads of records sound. as bass as well that people, yeah, yeah 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 but have it's always used like it for, you must have used it for bass on some records i have actually i have used it for it yeah but it's like it's people i think naturally kind of gravitate to it. i think because it's it's 
it's so revered for mm. it's like pad nature and that yeah. kind of modulation and stuff like that and you the know, chorus um, as well, I guess. the yeah. chorus on it's beautiful yeah. as well obviously yeah. you know um but yeah i i kind of it's it's tough for me to commit to something that i don't have experience of like i could say you know like a, like a some extraordinary rare synth mm. um but this is juno but, 6 not 60 not 106 no the 6 yeah yeah i mean um Again, because I I feel I know it inside out, so mm. so I, I probably wouldn't want to lose that. Um, All right, well, let's pause. Well, let's lock that in and then have a listen. Yeah. So Will's going to take you through what you've just selected before we get yeah, onto your I'm final. Look, it, aren't I? Before you get onto your final luxury <laughs> item, okay? So Will, set the scene for us here. We're in North London mm -hmm. in a studio complex, populated by the great and the good of music production. Okay with a great sounding live room based on conch. The computer is a Mac Mini M2, and that's a bargain at only £1,049. Great if you want to upgrade. Your interface is an Apollo X8P. Your DAW is Logic Pro X. And for your six items, you've chosen a Neve VR60, the one from Strong Room. For your speakers, you've chosen Genelec 1031As. You've chosen the custom POM Audio Designs SSL compressor clone called the Mustafa SSL 3000. You have a Trident preamp bucket from the Flexi Mix, a Shure SM7B for your microphone, and your one and only synthesizer is a Juno 6. How does wow. that work for you? Sounds all right, actually. Uh, I think I'm going to need some more ins and outs, aren't I, digitally? <laughs> well, I'm going to run that VR off a... Uh, of an Apollo. <laughs> Could I just swap that out for a HD rig? Like a pro, like a, like just some kind of. Sure. Yeah. So there you we can, go. You can change it to a uh, Pro Tools HD rig. Yeah. It's a massive one. Yeah, I'm going to need it, aren't I? So I didn't think this through properly, did I? Which is <laughs> exactly what That's I the point actual, of the podcast. With my, yeah. with my studio, yeah. when I put it together, I'm mm. sort of like, I'm going to need more than this, I'm going to need more than that, so... Well, let's. Yeah. Uh, let's do you think you could do everything you needed to do with that, though? Say so you've got the the Pro Tools HD rig, you've got just one microphone, one synthesizer. I mean, using Logic, yeah, with everything that it has inside of it, uh -huh. yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, don't, I think so. I mean, you know, in respect of, you know, I um, I've done a lot of things with just using onboard Logic stuff or stuff mm. within that I've bought into Logic because mm -hmm. obviously we're discounting sample sounds and whatever. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I think so. Great. Yeah. Uh, okay. Forever locked in. I think so. <laughs> so now, before we get to the end of the podcast, we have the non-gear related luxury item. So something that you want in your studio that isn't a bit of studio kit. I made a baffler, right? A sound baffler. Okay. Right. Um, a massive one, right at the back of the room above the couch. Um, How difficult was it to make? Not hard. So I made a whole load of them before when I built. Not the baffling. <laughs> I wasn't baffled by it. No. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Great. <laughs> but I, um, I had, I used like this kind of acoustic fabric, and I had, I had a picture of Donna Summer printed onto the fabric mm. cool because um because every time when i'm in the studio I, I find that photograph of her and her smile and just her general aura just just like it's like sunlight in the room you know and those records as well of course so yeah i mean even those records. anything to do with sound just yeah. that smile yeah i mean that's that beauty um that image because um, that was I've, kind of a big inspiration for New Order's Blue Monday, wasn't it? Like the Donna Summer record. Yeah, it was our love. Our love was, yeah. Um, I mean, it isn't even about music. It's mm. it's 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 just her, you know? It's Amazing. just her whole... It's what she transmits. It's just beautiful. And, so we have um, that at the back of the control room? Or... In the uh, yeah, live I mean, room, I'd have it behind, behind me in the control room, yeah. so you weren't really staring at the image mm. whilst you're working. But I find that every time I turn around, it always surprises me. Yeah. You know, when I, mm. I always get Makes the same smile. feeling from it. The same way, like you just mentioned, like you know, New Order. Whenever I hear yeah. Blue Monday, I hear it like I'm hearing it for the first time. Yeah, every yeah. time I hear it, for some reason, I don't know. I'm not bored. 
of that record there's certain things that just have such a hold on you that that um is it 40 years or so 45 years it's 40 years for blue monday yeah Wow. Years. which is nuts yeah um <laughs> and it does still sound like you said like the first time every time you hear it it's one every, of those yeah things. it's it's uh, uh yeah and and um i mean i'm gonna need i'm gonna need bafflers in the room in the control room anyway yeah so perfect the massive one behind me with like i have in my studio um with donna excellent love that. well or a cat <laughs> well, let's get, go with donna you get, you get pets you get pets <laughs> and your loved ones and stuff so okay well that that concludes the building of the my forever studio for our alcan so thank, thank you so thank much you Errol. So much, thank, Errol. You. Oh, thank you thank for you joining much. us okay well thanks for tuning in we will see you next week for more adventures into studio forever goodbye bye-bye <laughs>